Thank you, Mark. Uh, I was now going to um, invite the CEO of uh, Oreos, but unfortunately, Sev got his um, diary all mixed up, and he thought it was the conference was yesterday, so he was here yesterday morning. So unfortunately, he's not able to be here, but uh, Gita has very kindly stepped up to the plate, uh, and um, Gita is is a uh, uh, part of the team at uh, Oreos, and I will let her uh, tell you about the, the work of, of Oreos. So, Gita, we're so grateful that you were able to come and uh, stand in for, uh, for Sev, uh, and he definitely owes you a big coffee, I think. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm sorry it's not Sev you're listening to. I will do my best to um, represent the work that we do at Aureus. Um, I think it's worth, before starting, uh, just quickly introducing myself. Um, my name is Geetha Damaratnam, and I am the Global Head of ESG and Sustainability at Aureus, so that's Environmental, Social and Governance. Uh, the way that we work at Aureus, a, a private equity firm, is we have a chief investment officer's office and the three of us within the CIO's office who each head up a function which we believe cross cuts across all the investments that we make. So there's investment advisory, there's uh, ESG and sustainability which I head up and we have portfolio management. So for every transaction that we get into, we make sure that we manage these three aspects from a global perspective as well as a localist uh, perspective. A little bit about Aureus. So we originally used to be a part of the British Development Finance Institution, the CDC, and 10 years ago, actually almost exactly to the date, 10 years ago, we were spun out of the CDC as a joint venture between uh, the CDC and the Norwegian Development Finance Institution, North Fund. Um, at that time, we had about 139 businesses that were invested in under the auspices of the CDC Funds Group which we were going to be managing out. These businesses were predominantly in Africa and Asia. Since then, we've gone on to raise $1.3 billion of fresh capital. We've set up 16 funds, and we've continued to invest in the same types of businesses to a large extent that we were investing in back then, which are small and medium-sized enterprises. Now, today, that space is quite broadly becoming known as the missing middle, as um, policymakers, as people generally are understanding the, the gap in financing for businesses at that stage. The topic that we're talking about with this panel is really about the ecosystem. And on one side, we are talking, I'm talking here about private equity, but the other side as well is just understanding that there are various instruments in a well-developed financial system in any market. And different markets around the world at different stages here, and regulation comes into play depending on where you are and how that starts to affect you, A, as a financier, and B, as a business that's looking for financing. So we have today about 121 businesses that we're currently invested in across Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Islands. Uh, the way that we're set up, we have 29 offices. Uh, there's one in London, there's only about eight of us here exiled to London. We have one person in the States, and the other 27 businesses are on the ground. They're in Latin America, they're in Africa, they're in Asia. Uh, we just closed our office in Papua New Guinea, which is quite a hairy place to do business. But the point is, for us, understanding local markets means one thing, which is you need to be there. Working with small and medium-sized enterprises, you need to be there because private equity, the true value of private equity comes from not putting cash on the table. It comes from working closely with businesses to help them grow. Now for our businesses, the businesses that we invest in, they are not just small and medium sized enterprises, they are at a particular stage of investment. We have understood over the years, it's almost 20 years that we've been investing in the emerging markets, we have understood where we as a firm of professionals actually does well, and that is helping businesses expand. So we have done some of the first deals in the regions to expand businesses um, across borders. 
And when we first started doing this in Africa, uh, there was a lot of skepticism about how this could work. Uh, ironically, where in um, most developed markets there's a lot of free trade agreements in, in emerging markets, what we face are it's a lot of bureaucracy, and Marx just talked about bureaucracy, but we have a lot of bureaucracy in terms of allowing free movement of people and goods, even within a region. It's getting a lot better. It's getting a, a lot better. If you look at Africa today, you do have the, the trading blocks which are formed in Southern Africa. You have SADAC, you have Comesa in East Africa, and so forth. Things are getting better. Um, we're tremendously op uh, optimistic about these markets. Uh, I also have to uh, confess I'm, I'm from Africa, so I'm particularly optimistic about uh, Africa. So with, uh, with Aureus, with that caveat in place, uh, with Aureus, the staff that we have in these offices are also from the local market. So we live, we breathe um, what we do. And uh, as, a, as a result, we found a model that we believe works, which is working closely with these portfolio companies um, those of us who are sitting here in London, it's rare for us to be finding a transaction that we'd like to get involved with. The way that we do have our uh, structure set up, the teams on the ground find the transactions, they work with the businesses, we have a governance structure that's set up whereby the global team has a board on the committee and we then evaluate the, um, the transaction, the business, as a part of the whole investment committee, the rest of whom are from the greater region. The types of businesses that we invest in. Um, can I actually just take a quick uh, poll here? How many people here are business owners? And how many of you are business owners of small or medium-sized enterprises? That's pretty much everybody, isn't it? You understand what the challenges are uh, with trying to, to manage your, your business. I'll, now, one last question, actually. How many of you have businesses in the emerging markets? OK. Some of the challenges that small and medium-sized enterprises face, I think, are the same, regardless of whether you're in the developed markets or the emerging markets. In the emerging markets, some of these issues are, however, more difficult to deal with. In terms of accessing financing, I mean, it was, what, 50, 60 years ago here in the UK that the Macmillan Gap report came out when the British government came to the understanding that small and medium-sized businesses can be the growth engine of an economy. However, there is that gap. There is that financing gap. It's difficult for them to get access to financing. It is no different in the emerging markets today. So trying to make sure, first of all, the capital is flowing is one thing. The next thing is, how is the capital actually flowing to the small and medium-sized enterprises? There are different ways it can come in. It can come in through um, investment, early stage venture capital, later stage private equity, or it can come in through uh, guarantees, through debt, providing access to lines of credit through banks. All of these form the ecosystem that um, businesses are a part of and that actually keep the economy moving on. For us with, uh, with Aureus, what we have seen from the beginning, from 20 years ago, and it's still something we see, and as I said, we're very optimistic about, is the sense of entrepreneurship that is in place in the emerging markets. So we don't back businesses coming from the developed markets into the emerging markets, we back local businesses. And small and medium-sized enterprises, local businesses in these markets, they are producing goods and services which are being consumed locally. Now, our first true test of that in recent times was during the financial crisis, the global financial crisis. And at a time when most businesses were taking a, a, a real hit, we found that actually our businesses strengthened. During that one year, our businesses strengthened by 25%. And that tells you something about the robustness, the resilience of these businesses. As long as they are producing goods and services, essential goods and services, which are required in their local communities within the broader regions, they have a natural resilience to international shocks. Um, 
With, with Aureus, so over the time that we've been investing, you know, at a certain point we sat down and said, okay, what, what have we learned here? Um, because it's obviously a process for ourselves as a private equity firm to make sure that we're not repeating the mistakes of the past. And also over the years, as we've raised fresh capital and set up new funds in new regions, we've also had to uh, think about the Aureus way of doing business and making sure that the new teams in the new regions also buy into that philosophy so that we're not making the same mistake in a new region. And so I'll just go through some of these things here. Private Equity Plus, we, we sat down and came up with a, a set of uh, principles we felt worked for us. We call it Private Equity Plus. And through this, what we do is we show our commitment to working with the, uh, the companies with which we invest. Now, contrary to what most people would, would believe, private equity inherently is not an evil asset class. The people who work for private equity firms are not inherently evil. There is a lot of... Um, secrecy traditionally, especially more in the developed markets around private equity, and I know the British Venture Capital Association started addressing that some years ago. The truth of the matter, as I said earlier, private equity is another form of financing, but what you are doing is working closely with the businesses. And we don't come in and take over the businesses, we don't strip assets, sell them. That is far from what we do. And for those of us operating in the emerging markets, it's absolutely counterintuitive because our reputation relies on how we deal with the businesses, because it's a long-term partnership. Our fund lives are 10 years, in some cases up to 12 years. We'll stay invested in a business for up to five, six years. It's a long time. Um, my, my colleagues will tell me that you know, they have closer relationships with these businesses than they do with their own spouses, because you are on call 24 hours a day. Now, we take minority stakes in businesses. And there's a very good reason why we take minority stakes. It signals something to the entrepreneurs. It signals to them that we don't have the intention to come in and destroy everything it is that they're trying to build. We make sure that we are aligned. And that, for me, is truly the beauty of private equity. It is alignment. You get all the parties to be uh, working to the same goal because it is for the benefit of everyone to achieve that same goal. And I'm now going to move a little bit further into the development impact of such uh, transactions and working with businesses like this. Earlier on, um, Dr. Kim had spoken about just cards, and it, it got me thinking. You can either create a business which from the beginning is going to have a cultivated development impact, or you can also think about the fact that Traditional businesses do have a tradi traditional development impact in terms of they provide people with jobs, they increase training, you know, through the supply chain, the value chain, they're able to increase the uh, potential livelihood of those of, uh, who are involved, right? For us, dealing with the portfolio companies, and that's why we have a separate function set up to manage this, we talk about both process as well as output. So process is how is it these businesses are doing business? And that's where we make sure that they are doing what they need to do to be compliant, not just with local regulations, but we actually ascribe to the uh, World Bank IFC performance standards on the environment, on social issues, and on governance. Many of these businesses we invest in are, for the most part, actually not bad corporate citizens. I can walk in and ask a sponsor, do you have a CSR program? And nine times out of 10, the CEO will turn around and go, what do you mean? What do you mean by a CSR program? If I rephrase the question and ask, are you doing something for your community? The answer is, of course. The businesses that we back, many of them are family owned businesses. They have been in these markets for years. And as a natural part of doing business in these markets, they have integrated with their communities. So they will go out of their way. I'll give you a couple of examples um, at the end of this presentation to sort of illustrate this point. The reason I want to dwell on it slightly is to try and just bring out a point here to dispel the myth. It's really important to dispel the myth that we don't have good local businesses in the emerging markets. There are plenty which have got very high standards. And I can tell you today, the leading standards on corporate governance do not come out of Washington. They come out of South Africa. And these are the king standards on corporate governance. When we talk about innovation in the emerging markets, we are seeing some phenomenal things right now. And 
as you, it, it, it sort of um, supports the, the theory that once you have capital and once you have got a concentration of knowledge, you start to see the emergence of good ideas, good products, good services. In the UK right now, we are seeing Barclays Bank incorporating some of the technology that's been developed in Africa with mobile to increase the ability of consumers to access mobile banking here. And that's what a truly globalized world is, right? That's when you have free-flowing ideas and innovation going not just from the global south to the global north, but going across. One of the, the beauties of working for a firm like Aureus, you know, with the infrastructure that we have and working on the group level, the global level, we're able to really identify these, these models and we look for synergies and make sure that that business we've invested in, in China, which manufactures solar panels, is talking to the business we've invested in Senegal that actually does thermal power. So we are very actively encouraging collaboration between our businesses. And even if nothing more than a conversation comes out of it, you are setting up new links. Um, one thing, a quick thing to mention as well, the United Nations um, Principles for Responsible Investing, we signed up to that last year. And interestingly enough, we had to change nothing to comply with that because we had been in full compliance with them all along. It's a, it's a very good um, initiative, I think, because it streamlines um, the thought around private equity and how they should be engaging with, uh, with businesses. With the financial ecosystem, different businesses at different stages in the life cycle require financing, different types of financing. Now, what we would say is equity financing actually needs to come in before debt. So early stage venture, I'm not going to go into that because that's not really what we do. Um, but you can start by thinking about the individual who's focusing on survival. Quite often, you know, microfinance would maybe be providing that sort of financing. If you move on to micro businesses, it's still somewhat subsistence based, right? But now you have micro investing and low levels of, of debt, but they're very low levels of, of debt. There are some interesting models that are emerging now in terms of retail uh, finance for this market. And these, um, I think the micro businesses, there's a lot that needs to be done with those because that's another point at which um, a catalytic effect can take place. Small and medium sized enterprises. Now that is our area and you have early stage and you have growth. What do they need? They need venture, they need uh, private equity, which is more expansion capital. So for us, when we're scaling businesses, what we look for is a business that has been in existence for at least three to five years, is cash flow positive, a business which has pretty much almost tapped out its resources, its human resources, its, uh, its capital base, and now needs to consider moving to that next level, perhaps new products, perhaps new markets. And with our first generation of funds, what we were doing was investing in businesses and growing them within the region. So investing, for example, in a microfinance bank in Kenya, growing it into Uganda, Tanzania, Southern Sudan. But with our second generation of funds that we have today, what we have as a strategy is to do that and then to jump that business across to West Africa or to jump it across to Southern Africa and to really build regional powerhouses. Um, SAB Miller, uh, it's the second, third largest brewery in the world, it's a South African company. We need to see more of these businesses forming. They have a natural understanding of the markets in which they're operating. And so you start to see the knock-on impact all the way through to where they're sourcing their goods and services from. With large businesses, um, that is an area we don't, we don't go into, but for them, predominantly, debt is a, is, is a primary source of funding for many of these businesses and large-scale private equity firms. Um, if we look at Africa today, Carlyle has now entered, I think Black, um, Blackstone as well, KKR on the horizon. So there are some very interesting things happening. And yes, trying to fundraise for emerging markets is difficult. It is easier to sell, for example, the BRIC story than it is for the non-BRIC countries. But then if you look at even the Goldman Sachs report on the next 11 economies, would you be investing in Bangladesh? Well, it's still harder to, to convince people to invest in Bangladesh than it is if you say India, if you say China. 
that's a that's a perception thing and and as mark had mentioned earlier it is also associated with the with the brand of a, a continent and we just hope that we continue to try and get the good story out and also say for those investors who are skeptical and who think there are only seven or eight countries in africa come and visit I alluded earlier to the challenges that small and medium-sized enterprises face. And, you know, if we were to plot them on an axis of scale versus time, you know, we're talking about things like access to markets, lack of governance systems and processes. I can't tell you how many businesses we've invested in which did not have a board. They're family-owned businesses. So you have the patriarch as the CEO, you may have the uh, aunt as the, as the HR director, and the decisions get made around the dinner table. Never a safe place to make a decision, especially when it comes to family. So part of our value add is actually professionalizing the firm, bringing in external managers. We have done a number of management buyouts as well, management buy-ins too, and this increases the sustainability of the, of the business because it now goes beyond the lifetime of the, the strong family ties. Um, some of the other challenges that businesses face here, poor management discipline. Uh, we are a huge fan of um, IT systems. So one of the first things that we do when we go into business is get an MIS system into place. Now for us, we feel also more safe because we know that it is easier to get timely uh, reporting, financial reporting coming out of the businesses. For them, they are able to see more quickly how things are changing within their business and are able to then incorporate that back into the, the cycle. So I'm just going to very quickly go through two case studies, um, two examples of businesses. Brookside Dairies, phenomenal company. So it was founded in 1993 after the deregulation of the Kenyan dairy sector. And today Brookside is the leading milk processor in, in Kenya. So they are processing about 750,000 liters of milk a day. Now, where Brookside gets really interesting, and this model is actually unique as far as we're aware in Africa, is they source their milk from small-scale farmers, from over 100,000 small-scale farmers. Now, most of the, the models for dairies in Africa, you've got large ranches who are providing milk into, into the big dairies. Not the case with, uh, with Brookside. What they've done is heavily invested in the cold chain storage, and they have set up uh, collection centers across Kenya, and so what you have is, in some cases, they're sourcing from cooperatives which have taken the trouble of, of um, coordinating certain farmers together, or just individuals. Uh, just yesterday, I was uh, talking with one of my colleagues, and he was telling me about an IT person, a professional in Nairobi, who has a small farm outside of Nairobi. And what he does is he has 20 cows, and he also is part of the, the supply chain into Brookside. So it's not just that image of that one individual struggling farmer. I think when it comes to agriculture in Africa, it is a complex business, but it is also far more nuanced than you would imagine. With Brookside, they are directly employing 1,500 Kenyans and indirectly um, sort of supporting 150,000 people. They are exporting within the region, into Tanzania, into Uganda, uh, into Sudan as well, uh, they're also going up into the Middle East. And were they doing that when we invested? No. Over the years, it has been a huge privilege to be a part of this story as the company has grown from strength to strength. Now, the thing they have not compromised on is quality. So they will literally have labs testing the quality of the milk at collection centers. Now, once the milk leaves the cow at four o'clock in the morning, a clock starts ticking. You need to get it into, a cold, into the cold storage chain very quickly. And so these are the kind of challenges that they address. They have a huge farmer outreach program where they provide um, education, they provide access to technology, training. They even provide workshops on breeding. So they are thereby ensuring the quality at that point in the chain. The success factors as well. The management team is very strong. It's very, very strong. The utilization of technology has been hugely instrumental in them being able to manage the supply chain of, of the business. And uh, they also have looked to form partnerships with others to address the challenges that they can't directly um, 
um, address themselves. So they've partnered with banks to provide loans for farmers and so forth. So they've had to think outside of the box and in doing so they have created a phenomenal business that today is thriving. Dipped Products is a uh, business that was part of the Haley's Group in Sri Lanka and we invested in the business some years ago. Um, it produces rubber gloves, so it produces about 4 to 5% of the world's non-medical rubber gloves. Um, rubber, as some of you may know, originally came from Brazil, um, and uh, the, the British then managed to transplant that into Malaysia and then into Sri Lanka. So they're big rubber plantations in both those parts of the world. The rubber technology over time has, has improved, with uh, Sri Lanka, as it was going through a privatization mode some years, some decades ago actually, the Haley's group sat down and said, we need an incubator to think of how we can actually create industries using the raw materials that we have. Rubber was one of them. And one of the things that developed was, was dipped products. So we took a 5% stake in the business. And where this was also quite an unusual transaction, we did a management buyout. When you do a management buyout in a company, usually it's about three, four, five people. There were 115 people in this management buyout. It was huge. And uh, what it also did though, is it really got the people who bought into the business invested into it. it goes back to alignment of interests. And the business that they produced was one that came up with the world's first fair trade rubber glove. It is a business as well that created a program called First Light and they were sourcing almost all their rubber from small scale rubber uh, plantation owners. And some of these individuals were not plantation owners, they were individuals who had three, four rubber trees in their backyard. So what they did is, first of all, they came up with a program that made sure that each of these individuals was going to be getting a, a home, or at least had a home. The second thing is improving the quality of the rubber that was tapped so they increased the um, access to technology. And when I say technology, I include everything from you know, the fact that these rubber, uh, the tappers were using uh, coconut shells to collect the rubber. And as a result, you know, you'd have quite a lot of uh, material, biological material mixing in, which was reducing the quality of the rubber. So getting them to move to plastic containers, um, educating them on how to store the rubber and so forth. Dip Products um, First Light Initiative is, is truly a fascinating one and uh, it had a huge impact on the rubber industry within Sri Lanka uh, as well. And the interesting thing again is they were not working with large scale plantation, uh, plantations. The same way that Brookside was not working with large scale ranches. It is impact going really low down into the communities. Um, we, invest, we invested in them and we had our exit last year, uh, but we still very closely follow them. So on that note, um, I'm hoping that we've managed to uh, share with you a little bit of what we do, a little bit of our history and how we believe that is actually making a difference. Um, but more on an institutional level, though we do have another 119 examples of businesses today which are having a huge impact. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gita, and uh, you know we have a great admiration for all that Oris uh, does, and uh, we're grateful for an update from you today.